so I'm from the third floor, obviously. Um, we specialize in visualization. Um, there's many forms of viz, many vizes, as we say. Um, so I'm going to sort of try to sort of go over those. And again, uh, I, I want to link this in again with, with some of the things Ileana was showing about storyboarding. Um, you know, previous, a lot of the time is just a 3D storyboard. Um, and so every every sort of creative and technical and sort of uh, questioning process you use when you storyboard, uh, it's the same thing that you do in 3D afterwards. So anything you do with storyboarding is super useful. Um, I'll try to keep moving quickly because we've got a bunch of material and I want to make sure we have time for questions. So um, hopefully on your screen, there's a very handsome gentleman in an awesome shirt. Um, he looks a bit like me. Um, but so just sort of Going back to, to Eliana's question, um, I'm sort of rewinding, you know, how I ended up where I was, because uh, one of the great things with our industry and especially the area we're in in Previs, we collect all sorts of interesting people from all over the world and from many different backgrounds. Um, what we mainly look for is creative problem solvers. It might be story focused, uh, you know, problems we're trying to deal with. It might be technical problems, but creative problem solvers is kind of a a nice general wrapper for um, what we sort of looked through in, in previous. Um, so yeah, back back to the beginning. Uh, I started out in the 90s um, and uh, in Australia, hence the accent. Um, there wasn't much going on, to be honest, back there. I think Animal Logic uh, was one of the few companies in existence and they did a few commercials, but not much else. So this is pre-Matrix days. Um, so there was no internet no YouTube videos, none of the uh, training courses or free software. Um, so very hard to get into an industry that was a bit invisible. Um, so the way I managed to do it, because I was doing graphic design at the time, was just trying to get deeper into good, you know, a more complex CG, having seen sort of, you know, uh, Toy Story and Jurassic Park and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just picked up the old yellow pages, which we don't really see these much these days, but massive big telephone book of all the businesses. And I just went through all the sections that were like TV or something or other that seemed relevant. I just called each of the companies and asked if they did 3D animation. Um, it took a long time. I think it took about a year before I found what the names of those sorts of companies were and what it was I needed to ask. Um, uh, and finally you know started to isolate uh, who these people were that's how i discovered animal logic um called them asked them some really stupid questions what are nerves um was one of my questions uh but they were super helpful um so they were lovely um and one of the things to remember back in those days the barriers to entry uh cost wise were huge um there wasn't the trickle down of 3d software to pcs at that point to desktops um because the graphics cards that we know and love today, the NVIDIAs that we game on or, or work on, those really, they weren't a thing. They were just about to come out. Um, but so in order to get something that could do a more than a wireframe object in 3D, you had to basically get dedicated workstations. And at the time there was a company called Silicon Graphics that did basically the whole film and physics and nuclear and military uh, industries uh, PCs. Uh, and they started at about 80,000 pounds for one of those. Uh, and then any 3D software that ran on those was about 20 to 30,000 pounds per copy. Um, and then if you wanted, you know, uh, manuals to go with it, that was like another 500 to 1,000 pounds for the software manuals. So um, there was no way to learn any of that stuff unless you had access to um, a machine that basically was worth more than your house. Um, so it took me a while to cut a deal with a place so I could learn at night on their systems when they went home after I finished my day job. And I basically worked my way through these manuals on their quarter of a million dollars worth of equipment um, so that I could be of use. Um, and then I started doing demos for them um, and uh, talking to customers who were trying to get things working. Um, and then I gradually transitioned from my graphic design job uh, and finally got like, I got to animate a butterfly in a TV commercial. And that was my first paid gig. Um, and from there, I sort of, you know, just kept moving on and on. Um, and again, it's an industry that supports 
you know, it's all around the world. It's huge demand. So uh, one of my big things was wanting to travel. I wanted to work overseas uh, and keep traveling. So from there, I sort of went to Kuala Lumpur, Southeast Asia after a couple of years, ran a 3D department, went to Berlin, directed animated series, went to LA, worked at DreamWorks, and then came back over to uh, London, having done a couple of sprinkles of some time in Rome doing commercials, et cetera. Um, so there's lots of opportunities out there. And the big thing is wonderful people from all over the world to spend time with. Um, so that was sort of where I started. And now I've sort of having directed and supervised Anim, I realize the most interesting point of the whole process where all of the storytelling locked in for me when I was directing was in what we called like digital layout or something at the time back in the 90s. Basically, it was what Previs was going to become. So I never went back to animation. Uh, I just stuck with Previs after that because after that, it slowed down and to me got a little bit boring. I just like to lock all the story stuff and move on. Um, so that led me eventually to where I am now. Um, and then I've been transitioning out of Previs and supervising Previs on a bunch of movies for the last sort of 15 years. Now I'm sort of shifting across into virtual production, which is, you know, the real time version of Previs, if you will. Um, and it's a very exciting time to be in the industry. It's like the 90s all over again. It's like Jurassic Park days. It's just the world is changing with all the stuff we do. And it's super exciting. Um, and so I'm lucky enough to manage a fantastic team of people there. Very, very clever. We're very small. Um, I think there's about eight or nine of us in my team, but we've nearly tripled in size uh, this year um, because virtual production is going gangbusters. Um, so I manage the team um, and uh, interact with all the clients across all the projects before sort of handing off to the senior people uh, from my team that are covering each show. Uh, I work with the recruitment, work out training that's required. Um, I also like to dabble in actually developing tools and things myself, but I do not get enough time. Hence, I've been learning C++ on my weekends because I'm just too busy during the week. Um, and then uh, part of my job with outreach as well at Third Floor is um, sort of uh, interacting with the whole filmmaking community, um, gaming community as well through UK and Europe, um, looking at how some of the techniques that we've got or that we may have sometime soon might help them uh, get more creative freedom or more creative iterations or better help them answer some of their creative or technical questions. Um, and then I do lots of demos of tools and um, I think, as it says here, I act as a technology evangelist, which is pretty cool. I got to get that on my card. Uh, I don't have that yet, but I will. Um, so jumping along, I'm just going to play a little bit of material. I'll adjust the volume because I don't want to blow eardrums. Uh, let's just start low and see how it goes. Uh, and there's a little bit of an overview of some previous sort of things. And there's a couple more videos I'll show, but um, I'll keep it moving because I talk too much.
it was cool. I haven't seen a lot of that stuff. Some of my shots got in there. Happy days. Um, so that hopefully, um, let me not play it again, sort of shows a good overview. Um, and uh, again, as I said, I know I sort of talk a lot, so definitely feel free to interrupt with any questions or bits that leap up that might be relevant. Um, so, you know, again, hopefully from that, you can see the sort of range of material we work on. That one's pretty glossy because that's the 15 year anniversary reel. Um, so it tends to be pretty much the top end. We do a lot of simpler stuff and uh, smaller budget things as well. Um, but that's the sexy stuff. So I guess that's why it makes it in. Um, running over the sort of the range of visas that we sort of work on. Um, some of them are well known, other ones not so much. Uh, just sort of as a breakdown, uh, first of all, we sort of, we cover pitch fears. That traditionally is kind of the glossiest, highest end uh, pre viz type material we do. And this is because usually that happens when uh, a project uh, a director or, or a producer or someone has been given a bunch of development cash to go off and, you know, cause they've got a great script. They've got some cool people attached. Um, the studio is interested in the concept, but they're not fully committed yet. So they give them a bunch of cash and they need to come back with the presentation of how kick-ass the movie is going to be and therefore why it will make squillions. Um, so the pitch fears we do is it's kind of a bit like the sort of um, the, the trailer for a game or something, not the gameplay necessarily, because that might be slightly compromised. This is the super glossy cinematic version of the, the gameplay. Um, you know, it's so awesome. You'll never quite see it on your own PC. But so this pitch is we, you know, don't tend to have live action footage. It will just be a full 3D, like a really glossy AAA game cinematic. Um, and that goes back to the execs of the studio with the theory that off the back of it, they're going to unlock a whole truckload of money and say, go make this movie um, and here's a uh, hundred million dollars. Um, so I've done a bunch of those. Um, I've worked on some of them. Uh, I remember one of them was successful and this is a ways back was uh, for Dean Devlin, uh, Geo Storm uh, is a good example of that. We did pitch fizz for that. Uh, and again, you know, off the back of it, they they got a massive deal to go make that movie. Um, so super glossy. It's about selling the idea and the experience uh, of amazingness. Um, and so that's not looking to answer any technical questions. It's not about practicality. It's just about awesomeness. Um, so those can be a lot of fun. Uh, some people absolutely love that stuff. Some people are not into the, going to that higher level of detail and fussing. Horses for courses. Um, Next along the little list, we've got previs. So again, you know, somewhat similar, and most people are familiar with this. With this, the theory with previs is it's there to be a full three D storyboard of either entire sequences, entire films, sometimes, um, but usually to cover the very complicated sequences that will involve massive visual effects or uh, potentially dangerous special effects stunts, that type of thing. Um, so it might answer a number of questions. And again, the key thing for us as a previous company, when we come onto a project, what we really want to know, the, what we like to ask is, what questions are we here to help you answer? Because that's the thing with, with previs. Um, it's not just one thing where every show, every director, every VFX supervisor, every DP, every exec producer or showrunner, they have different constraints they're working. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's not money at all. Um, so we may be there to focus on just doing, uh, helping the director find a way to unlock their story. And it's all about storytelling. So again, 3D storyboarding. Um, sometimes it's a mix of many factors, um, but hopefully during the previous stage, it's mainly about creating a nice cutting version of the film containing all the CG elements, et cetera, uh, that everybody can just sign off on and go, that's what we're shooting. Let's break it down. Let's get a shot list together and work out a shooting schedule. Um, so the previous doesn't provide that, it provides the blueprint that you then turn into all of the data for planning, planning the film production. And that's where we tend to then shift it once we've got creative approval, shift it into tech fears. 
Uh, this is not a very creative sort of part of the process. There is some creativity involved a lot of times, but it's, it's very technically minded. Um, not everyone will be doing all of these parts. Some artists love jumping between all of them. Some have very bespoke focuses. Um, Tech Fizz is slightly more nerdy and we have a lot of cool uh, nerdy type folks that um, enjoy breaking all of the things down. Uh, so I think I've got a little bit of footage of um, uh, the Tech Fizz uh, just to explain a little bit better. But basically you take the pre -viz, you look at the real world constraints. How is this going to be shot on the day? What, what camera, what cranes the camera on, what tracks the, the, um, the crane on? Uh, is it on a is it on a cable? Are there safety issues? Are we shooting a person on a hydraulic rig? Um, is there flame? Is there explosions? Are there things falling? Uh, what's going to be real? What's going to become a digital double, etc., etc., etc. The tech viz explodes the previs 3D shot into all the real world components and all of the VFX components so that they can be broken down and planned. Um, then. With your tech viz, you plan your shoot, you build all sorts of stuff, got all the blueprints, you shoot, and then you get the footage from that back as soon as possible. And then in a lot of these big, say like Marvel, Lucasfilm type things, uh, the footage has got lots of green or blue or empty skies where there'll be cool, exciting stuff later on. It can be difficult for the editor to edit that footage when the creatures are not there or the spaceship's not flying through or the explosion's not happening or the magical something or other is not spinning around. Um, and that stuff needs to be edited and presented and get feedback and stuff. So that's what we do post fears. We basically take the plates and then we use parts of our, we go back into our previs, pull out all the elements as comp layers and then maybe having adjusted the previs a bit, having tracked the real camera of what happened, will regenerate previs layers and then comp them back in so that in theory, the editor now has a rough, almost what we call a VFX temp, but don't tell VFX because ours are a bit rubbish, um, but it's kind of a temp version of what that shot will look like with all the VFX in. Um, so he can edit together, everyone can follow it. You can buy off on the edit. And then also for the visual effects vendors who've put in bids, this gives them a nice blueprint now so they know exactly what elements are in. Because when they bid it, that was probably months ago, everything's gone out the window, plans changed. Um, popped on the end of this slide is virtual production. Um, it's its own sort of little thing at the moment, but it's creeping into everything. Um, and really in a way that should go before previous now because we're getting virtual production is uh, basically using real-time tools to empower pre-production. So you can integrate uh, more people directly with CG content. They can, you know, people who are not Maya savvy um, or Unreal Engine savvy, it might be the DP, it might be a, an art director or something. They have some real-time way of interacting with what will be virtual content. Um, and that's mainly what that's there for. So. Um, that's most of the visas. There's more visas, but de design visas, all sorts of stuff, but we won't go into that today. Um, as far as scope and the different sort of, you know, verticals that we fit into, um, feature film is our mainstay and has been sort of since the beginning. Um, and uh, we work on a lot of high-end TV, heaps of Netflix, um, Apple, Amazon stuff, uh, themed attractions, so, you know, uh, theme parks, some people might call them. Uh, we do quite a bit of uh, work with uh, those guys around the world. Um, we do a bunch of work with games companies, uh, usually around their cinematics. Uh, so I think, you know, all the Apex Legends um, uh, trailers that come out, we pre all of those entirely. Um, and then generally the studios themselves then go about making them all based on our, our previs with that they've got all the assets and their custom engines, et cetera. Um, and then we've done a little bit of VR and AR, um, some experiences um, along the way. And uh, we do a small amount of commercials. Um, normally, because we're quite busy, uh, we don't have time to fit in many commercials and things. And again, for us to get involved, they usually, there's usually some very specific complex needs that makes it uh, a good idea for us to get involved. Um, 
So there we go, scope of work. Um, and then looking over roles, um, uh, you know, it's all pretty plain there, you know, storyboarding, love storyboarding, um, previs and post-vis artists. So again, previs, you know, let's just call it Maya, post-vis, let's say After Effects, Nuke, bringing the previs components as render layers and then putting them over the plate, uh, a bit of tracking. Uh, production support. So we have quite a big uh, production team who are tracking, interacting with clients, interacting with artists, managing workflows, making sure we're hitting milestones. Um, we have a lot of data coming backwards and forwards, especially once you work on Disney Marvel shows, the reporting structures going backwards and forwards to clients are not trivial. There's a lot of information that they're swapping around. Uh, virtual production. That's me, that's my team. Um, we've got editors, because you can see with our reels and things, we have to edit a lot of material together. Um, uh, game engineers, so, you know, C++, dev kind of thing. Um, we're integrating more of uh, those sorts of folks in as the virtual production thing just keeps growing. Uh, and VR designers, again, you know, they can be called TAs, TDs, there's different terms, uh, mainly borrowed from the games world. Um, but that sort of covers the bulk of the types of roles we've got. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a little sort of breakdown insight into what we're sort of looking at. Again, you know, my one liner is creative problem solvers. Um, this is probably a better version. What have we got here? Um, you know, skilled and versatile. Again, we're responding to the bespoke requests of clients on a film. Every show is different. There is no rule of what we're doing and what the client needs us to do. Um, uh, and then when we start to look at sort of subcomponents and specialities, we've got shot creators who, who create shots, um, not surprisingly. So key focus on story composition, editing, animation, um, you know, clarity of vision with trying to communicate stories visually. Um, asset builders, we have a bunch of people that really just like creating assets, stuff, environments, worlds, creatures, um, so modeling, shading, etc. cetera. Um, and then, you know, the additional skill sets um, that people don't tend to arrive with, um, they tend to learn them with us. Um, you know, compositing, some people know that, uh, tr camera tracking and things through th something like PF track. Um, uh, we're pulling in a lot of motion capture these days more than, you know, doing lots and lots of hand animation of, you know, people walking around doing stuff. Um, uh, effects, you know, fire explosions, simulations of bits. We try not to go too far on that, but we do do a little bit. Um, and virtual reality, which I think we need to get rid of virtual reality because it's becoming a bit passe, but, um, you know, uh, real time uh, engine based skill sets might be a better term there. Um, so software wise, no surprise, I don't think for anyone. Maya has been the mainstay um, of previs since version one. Um, and After Effects is our default comping uh, sort of package, just for historical reasons. It's, it's quite unusual in most other places. But for us, it's always been the previs go to. Um, asset building, Maya, Photoshop, ZBrush, Substance. Um, we are seeing things like Blender creeping in because it's just it's good at what it does um, and the price is fantastic um, uh, and it's just growing it's getting stronger and stronger got some lovely lovely features in it so um, we're big fans of Blender it just doesn't tend to pipeline the way something like Maya does um, and uh, you know for post viz again you know combining the live action with the CG layers um, again Maya After Effects PF track for tracking and Nuke if people are cool with Nuke, then you can use that as well. Um, and then virtual production, Unreal Engine. Um, and a note there with Unreal is it's it's moving quite aggressively out of just virtual production and it's starting to nibble at a lot of other things. Um, you know, they're putting in comping stuff, they're putting in uh, basic modeling, they're putting in animation rigs and things. So um, we see over the next few years, uh, the sort of thing of being 99% Maya, 1% Unreal will start to shift quite markedly uh, and we'll do more in Unreal Engine, we, we believe. Um, and then uh, additional skill sets that we love, um, knowledge of cameras, you know, which end you point at the people. Um, no, it's, you know, you know, lenses, 
what's when you what's the difference between putting a 24 and a 75 uh when do you use them uh what effects do they have you know it's not again we expect people to arrive at the door just knowing that stuff we have a lot of training material um but if you know that stuff that's 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 brilliant um rigging you know if you if you can rig doesn't have to be complicated um but just doing basic rigging and mire of props or something that means we don't have to pull an asset person to come and you know uh, rig up something that's got uh, two pivot points um and a little controller on it mal scripting uh starting to go more nerdy here um and then what's missing from that one i think which we'll probably need to put in these days is python uh because mal scripting is very specialized but still cool um but we tend to do more of our coding for tools and, and that sort of thing in Python at the moment. And then uh, mocap cleanup and that sort of thing. Again, not a skill a lot of people just sort of arrive with. Um, moving along still, um, just sort of going over again, you know, previous, and I think we've covered it a bit, but going into more of the details, um, it's, it's part of the big, the visualization process. Um, and again, scribbling a drawing on a post-it note is part of the visualization process uh, and the quicker you are and the better your drawings are the more viz you can do with a pencil um, but as far as the previous when we're talking about our side of things the traditional maya sort of 3d it's a it is this sandbox to basically bring in puppets uh, and pretend cameras and a you know, pretend world, basically rehearse and block and try different things and different cameras and movements and timing and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, you know, in a way it's, 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 the, it's the cool version of having some Lego characters and an iPhone um, and you get to explore your filming ideas in the computer. Um, you know, and again, if they want to go crazy with lighting, et cetera, we can start doing that. The question just comes up of whether that's the best use of time, usually during previews. Um, on a lot of Star Wars and Marvel things, because of the numbers of people involved and their different backgrounds in the approval process, we tend to notch up the level of finish. So a lot of the Marvel stuff is pretty sexy. Um, it's not really required all that detail to answer basic questions. But again, if it's going to be presented to executives who need to agree to budget changes and things, uh, it has to be really clear what this money is going to be doing. Um, so then we add a lot more gloss. Um, and it's a way, again, for directors and producers to explore ideas early. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, again, one of the key things I've said to sort of said to people with um, previous part of the reason it's there is to throw away things um you know it's a way to explore ideas and eliminate weak ones so you don't have to do that on set or at some other really expensive point you don't want to go wow that was a dead end we shouldn't have ever gone down this path hopefully previous you did that you threw it away and you went down a good path um and so that's kind of you know again part of the questions were there to answer it, should this idea go in the film is this shot worth spending money on does it does it earn its spot in this film. Um, now, uh, I'll just crack off this one. Um, I think this is an example. I think there's a bit of useful uh, audio here. So I'm just gonna just double check that it's coming through properly. At the third floor, we're often called on to help show the idea of a project or a scene before it gets started. Welcome to the underworld. From here, there are worlds above the worlds above worlds. It's where I used to live. And it's where you're gonna die. For Alita Battle Angel, we created this pitch piece with the filmmakers to provide a snapshot of what the characters and the world could be like in a big screen form. Using Previs, you can do simple blocking or take the look up to very high quality textured renders. We work from a beat sheet and storyboards to frame angles that directors and producers like and that looked cool and different. Dance, little the filmmakers wanted to show off fighting styles that would be a hallmark of the Alita universe. We incorporated motion capture to add believability to the previs of key action and stunts. After we modeled and animated the shots, the film's picture editor, Steven Rivkin, assembled them into a cut with sound effects, music, and dialogue. This helped the piece really capture the cinematic potential of the material within the pitch package. Super cool. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on time, so I'm going to keep it keep it moving. So again, just a good example, that piece, answering questions about that fight sequence. Um, and although we edit our own material together to make sure we're sort of trying to tell a clear sequence, 
uh, on a lot of the movies, hopefully we get to work directly with the picture editor who then starts to own the process and work with the director. Um, I'm going to quickly jump over tech viz, um, some of the stuff I talked about. So it could be just a simple one pager. Looks like something, a technical drawing out of Photoshop. Uh, PDFs could be, you know, four quick times uh, from all different angles with different things showing in, a, in, a, in an HD sort of master. Um, it might be answering where the green screen goes, what lens is this on, how fast is the camera moving, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm going to, uh, I think again, there's some useful stuff, so I'll keep the audio. Hey everyone. I wanted to give a brief explanation of what TechBiz means. At its core, TechBiz is the technical documentation of previs and postvis shots to clearly translate our 3D world into a format that can be used by onset departments to successfully set up a shot or a series of shots. Here at the third floor, we stress the importance of creating visualization that is both beautiful and practical. This means creating shots that have grounding in real world physics. And in the case of TechBiz, grounded by demonstrable measurement and evaluation. To this end, we use everything from physically accurate camera cranes to our own 3D LiDAR scans to ensure that what the client sees in our previs is what they will get on set. In this short commercial spot, you can see how we take very simple previs and expand it into an executable plan for the shoot. Here, we start with LiDAR scan to get an accurate representation of the limits of the environment we will be shooting in. Next, we use our Techno Dolly Rig to ensure that all of our camera movement is within the reach and speed of the crane's limits. Lastly, we carefully measure the position of subjects relative to the camera so that the positioning of the characters is one-to-one -one with the previous. And I think that's a, a good example there with um, especially that little commercial at the end. Um, a lot of times we go on to the smaller budget films we're not there to do creative story exploration. Um, they've got limited budgets. That's not a great use of the money for us. We tend to get involved when they have a complex shot, maybe two or three shots in the film that are potentially very complicated. They've got limited time and limited space to do it. And we tend to do tech viz for them. We help rough out what it will look like. They go, yes, that's, that's what we're after. But we've done it with the camera already mounted into a crane rig, making sure it doesn't punch a hole in the wall and we don't see off you know, the green screen too much. So they don't have to do too much post, et cetera. Um, so I've, you know, sometimes you might work for one day on a, on a show and, and just produce, you know, in that case, the question that we're there to answer is how can we shoot this? It's not, you know, what would be a cool idea for my film? Um, so with the feedback process, um, and I'm gonna, try to get through this so we've got like 10 minutes uh, because I'm going to get snatched into a client call, I think at six. Um, the, so, so the feedback itself in our industry, again, because it's so iterative, um, uh, some people initially can find it a little bit tricky hearing uh, basically rejection so much. But again, that's the point of previs. If we can prove that an idea is poor and should be abandoned immediately, then that's a success. Um, and I've sort of put that in here, I think, is that, you know, we're there to fail fast, um, not slow and expensively. We're there to, and this is where we love the, you know, the sort of metaphor of the post-it note with the pencil. If you can get a post-it note and do a quick thing and go that, and they go, no, I hate it. That's it. That's all it costs in order to eliminate that idea. Then you scribble like this, uh, wider. <laughs> yeah, okay, boom previous done. Um, so we eliminated two bad ideas and we kept one. Uh, and so that is part of the thing of, you know, uh, of previous. We are there to explore and to get rid of ideas that shouldn't make it on screen. Um, and it's a slightly different process to what some people are accustomed to. Um, uh, and most of the feedback is not about how great or what is great. <laughs> it's about what's not working. Um, and, but that's the thing. You eliminate all the things that are not working until it's like, yeah, yeah, I guess that'll work. Um, and that's a success. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things, because of all of that, the way that works, we try to be aware of, you know, let, reminding people the feedback is about what's not working in the shot. It's not about the person who did the shot, <laughs> especially some of the people are very blunt. Uh, we do get some feedback. It's like, what the bleep? That's the feedback. I don't know what this is. Um, so uh, 
that we try to clarify and do better. Um, and then again, just because of the structures with the way it works in the industry itself, there's, there can be many layers of who's approving what, who's talking to who and approves the thing that he approved. And um, But basically sort of, you know, when you come in an entry level, you'll tend to get immediate feedback from a, a senior artist or a lead artist on the show. They're helping shape it. Um, then it goes to the previous supervisor. Uh, so he's again, third floor. Um, he's sort of again looking over the whole thing and is basically saying that's ready to present to the clients now uh, i think that's delivering on what they asked uh, then a lot of the times we'll be going that'll be presented to the vfx supervisor but it could be the director very every show there'll be a different reporting structure um, so we can't assume anything at some point we're hoping it gets in front of the director um, and that feedback sort of trickles down uh, and then we just go in circles until the director goes, yep, next, what else you got? Um, and again, you know, just from our side, the less people that get between the artist and if it's the director who's the end client, the better, if we can compress that to like one or two people, then we get much clearer sort of feedback systems. No surprises, I don't think there for people. Um, and then, that shows all of our social thingies. Uh, I wouldn't know what to do with a lot of those, but I'm sure there are people here that uh, find that stuff useful. So make sure you grab all that. Um, but yes, that's sort of a, a quick trip through. Um, there's lots of stories that go with that, but that would take hours. So um, hopefully that's useful and hopefully we've got some time for some questions. Thank you so much, Brad. It was really a very, very informative and insightful presentation.